Hello, my name is Max Huberman, H-U-B-E-R-M-A-N, and I'll be 86 years old in the next, next two months. So I'm glad I'm still around and I have memories of my younger days up until the time of Pearl Harbor, which changed my life in many, many ways. I was affected by that because the France had been invaded by the Nazis and uh, I had relatives in Radom, Poland, where the Nazis had already expanded and lost a lot of relatives who went up to the chimney in Auschwitz. I felt very strongly about what was happening in the world at that time. I wanted to be somehow contributing to this. Pearl Harbor, which nobody expected, I certainly didn't know about it until I heard it on the, pay on the radio. The President of the United States was talking about it. Six days after Pearl Harbor, I don't think I was going to be a hero like anyone else, but I went down to the recruiting station and signed up for the United States Army. And I've had some interesting adventures in those four years that I served in the United States. A great adventure for me, not always happy ones, mostly sad ones. I lost many friends. I was one of the fortunate ones that came back unscathed. I was given certain opportunities I might not ever have had. They had the GI Bill of Rights, which enabled me to go to Columbia University, and the government was paying part of that tuition. And I went to the School of Journalism and uh, became interested in things I was reading about civilizations, about politics. I got a job as a Union organizer for the Hotel and Restaurant Employees Union, AFL-CIO. That gave me a purpose in life, doing things for others, helping people get better wages. My father, who died in the 60s, who was involved in the union activities, he was beaten up for fighting for what at that time was a revolutionary idea, a 12-hour day. And up until that time, there weren't many unions. Those that existed were fighting to fight for better wages, better conditions against the exploitation of children, discrimination against women and other minorities. I felt I was a part of something. Maybe I could make it a better world. The Army was an opportunity to do what I could. And I don't know what else people would be interested in. Max, were you born here in the United States? Now, I was born in Paris, France, September 1921. I came to this country when I was three years old, and at that time I learned how to speak English. I didn't think the time would come when I actually teach English and poetry, but that's what I did, and I became more useful. I worked in various occupations. I became an amateur boxer. I thought I might make a career about that until I realized there must be better ways to earn a living besides knocking people unconscious. I got involved in theater work, and I thought I might make a vacation out of that. I was able to utilize my knowledge of theater work, helping to organize things. I worked with the American Red Cross, various stations in the United States while I was in the service, helping to organize morale-building events for, for the Army, men and women, and I got a great deal of satisfaction out of doing that because I felt it was positive. It meant a lot to the Army, to soldiers like myself who faced dangers of death from one day to the next. I served in many areas of the United States in various services as a sergeant. When I was overseas, I served in what we call the CBI, China, Burma, India Theater of Operations. My job there was to train my men and hand-to-hand -hand fighting, drilling, judo. I did what I could and became an, an, a source of knowledge myself. As I say, I was glad to come home in one piece, and I remembered men that I left behind, killed at an early age. I think about that very much so when I see these baskets coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan today. And I wonder if it was all worthwhile, and I'm convinced that, yes, it was. But we all owe an obligation to those who give their sacrifices, 
not only in, 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 by, by, by giving their lives, but suffer coming home. I read about the events, people going to military hospitals where the care is atrocious because the priorities have been changed in many degrees. Politicians think more about getting into the jobs for political reasons than the welfare the people are supposed to represent. We still have indications where, to my feelings, discrimination against women is atrocious. In the United States, with all the progress we've made as a democracy, we still have women getting less pay than men. Women are exploited in many ways. There's much to be done, but uh, compared to some of the other countries where we have the opportunities that the other countries don't have. So we do what we can to be on the right side of law, the right side of ethics, the right side of what all faiths should teach us. But when people are more concerned about my God is better than your God, and this is what leads to these atrocities where people in the name of what they call their faith slaughter each other, and every day we hear more and more results of that. My children, I'm glad, and my grandchildren have inherited, at least to some degree from me, identification with their responsibility to, to, all, to all, because we all should not concentrate on what divides us, but what unites us as members of the human family. This should be our legacy for all of us. I'm also reminded, as I tell at many family gatherings, those words of Horace Mann, who founded Antioch College. 150 years ago, he said to his graduating class, be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. And if we dedicate ourselves to that proposition, that the purpose in life is to somehow worry, somehow achieve a little victory for humanity, to uphill those that have fallen, to give courage to those who need help. That is the best legacy we can give for our children, for our grandchildren, and to all of our relatives. That's, I hope to take that with me, even though I hope I still have a long way to go. I'm proud of that. And I, I, I think that's about it. As a uh, soldier, Max, as a first sergeant overseas, were you involved in any battles, engaged in any battles? Well, actually, I never knew whether I succeeded, but I learned to fire at overhead planes from the Japanese squadrons that were on the Burmese border. So I never got a body count. I like to think that I was able to accomplish as much with at least amount of killing or getting killed as possible. I never knew, and I'm glad of that, because I don't want to know. I only want to know that we finally the war ended peace was at hand. We found the democracy in Japan, which had been a militaristic dictatorship. Various countries, Germany now has the hopes, if not possibly all conclusions, the defeat of Nazism as, as we understood it. In Italy, the fascist regimes have been mistaken by what we consider true democratic opportunities and advancements. So I still have hope for this world. I see on the horizon, on the horizon even though bodies are coming home from Afghanistan and Iraq and parts of Africa, I say we still have hope. We've got to be on the right side. And that is, remember, we're all members of the human family. Don't, de don't determine whose God is better than whose God. It doesn't matter who your God is, as long as it's a God of faith, fraternity, and love for all others, regardless of what their religions are, their faiths, or ethnicity. As a soldier overseas... Uh, did you receive any letters from home, any communication of relatives from the United States? Well, we were getting communications all the time. We were keeping, kept uh, appraised to what was happening in the United States, and we were mostly concerned about the successes that we were having in different parts of the world in the war against fascism and Nazism. I was glad to be a part of that struggle because it meant it was all worthwhile. Uh, when the war ended, Max, where were you? The war ended, I was in India. And I remember my captain coming to me and saying, Sergeant, get all the men together for a line-up immediately. Some important announcement is to be made. I lined up all my men, got them out of their beds, lined them up. I didn't know what was going to happen. And the major gave a talk to all of us, saying, I just got a report that our commander-in-chief is dead. He was talking about Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's the first time I saw a major cry 
I knew that major because I talked to him. We attended a lot of shows together that I had organized for the, for the Red Cross. And to see him in tears, I couldn't help it. I cried too. I still think about it. I felt I'd lost my father when Franklin e. Roosevelt died. It meant a lot. I cried for a lot of others. I felt if I ever could get home safely, I'd do what I can to make it a safer world so we don't have people killing each other because of their differences, but loving each other for what they have in common as members of the human family. That's the legacy I want to leave for my children and grandchildren. And I think I'm succeeding there, and I'm very proud of that. And I want to congratulate you for giving me this opportunity to express myself. And uh, how many children do you have, Max? Did you have any at the time? You enlisted into the service? No, no, I got married as soon as I got out of the Army with, one of the, with this girl that I met at a USO during my service. She was what you would call a war bride. And you were made... married for more than... We've been married for more than 61 years. And when the war ended, you say you were in India at the time? Yes. What did you think of what did you think of uh, the atomic bombs dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima? Did you agree with that? No, I was terrified by it. I didn't think it was necessary because the Japanese had already given out indications that they were prepared to negotiate a surrender. But as I understood it from a political point of view, it was a political act. It was shown. It was just, uh, many believed it. I believed it at first. I didn't, but the more I thought about it, the attacks on, the atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was a signal, political signal, to the Soviet Union that you're next, because we're going to have to have some struggle to decide who owns Europe. And then there became the political divisions where uh, the Soviet Union, until it broke up and became Russia. Max, you're Jewish, right? Yes, I am. And during World War II, obviously a tremendous holocaust occurred. Were you aware of the Holocaust going on when you were serving in the war? Did you know that Jews were in concentration camps and yes. being, being incinerated? Yes. yes, we had to get reports with that. Chaim Wiseman, one of the leading Jewish rabbis at the time, was given information from the Polish underground that Jews were being rounded up, not only Jews but priests also, homosexuals, gypsies, all those people Did that you? the Hitler regime decided were non-Aryans were being taken and gassed in Auschwitz and other concentration camps. And relatives that we had disappeared in the concentration camps. Did you camp realize, Radom, did you have any idea of the extent of the genocide going on? No, not to the extent, only that it was enough to frighten me. As you look back on it now, do you think more could have been done to stop the, uh, the genocide in the concentration camps? Yes, quite a bit. I was disturbed later on when one of my heroes, Franklin D. Roosevelt, it was discovered that he had been told by his Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, not to waste time bombing these tracks to Auschwitz, as he was urged to do, whether we were leading cattle cars full of people to go to the crematoriums. It might not have solved the problem, but at least it would have delayed the slaughter, annihilation of these people. So, if I understand it right, you grew up in New York, I born in France, in but... We're up in New York. After the war, you returned to New York, got married, yes, and then lived in New York for a while. Yes. What was housing? Was what was housing? What was housing like after the war? Well, they couldn't find enough for the discharged veterans. I couldn't find a place to live, even though I had this record. I had papers on it, giving cases of commendation for my service. I thought this might impress the Veterans Administration to give me some priority, a place to live. Finally, it was on a Thanksgiving day, I got notice from the Veterans Administration that they found a place for me and my wife to live. And that was in Manhattan Beach in New York. One room apartment, it was heaven. And then they gave me uh, additional uh, entries into Columbia University under the GI Bill so I could go to the School of Journalism. They paid most of the tuition. You ultimately moved to Youngstown? And what, what has been your life well, in Youngstown, well, Ohio? Yes, I met her during the war in Youngstown at a USO. And I forgot her. I wrote her letters while I was in the Army overseas for a couple of years. So then when I got, when I got discharged, 
When I got discharged, I called up Youngstown, Ohio, says, I'm home, I'll be over to see you. I didn't propose on the phone, I did that when I came to see it. She said, yes. So I says, okay, as soon as possible, but we'll have to do it in New York. She said, no, we're going to get married, we'll get married here. She was giving me orders right then. I like that. Better than getting the orders I got from the captain while I was in the Army. What's your uh, fondest memory before the war, of America before the war? Your fondest memory? Well, I had dreams that I would become a professional fighter. Of course, I was an amateur boxer at the time, and I was very good at it. So we used to have a lot of street fights. And uh, There's a joke that you often tell about your boxing prowess. Oh, yes. Can you recall that joke? Yes, I do. Yes, I do, about these two friends who were in the bar. One says, I never told you this, but you know, while we're looking at the boxing matches on the, the TV, I was a boxer myself. I said, I didn't know that. He says, yes, I fought Rocky Marciano. You fought Rocky Marciano, the world's champion, heavyweight prize fighter? He said, that's right, and in the fourth round, I had him scared to death. You had Rocky Marciano scared to death in the fourth round? He says, yeah, he thought he killed me. There you go. All right. So that's one of my when favorite. you came back to Youngstown, what has your life been in Youngstown, Ohio? What was your career? Well, I went into partnership with, with, with my wife's father in the beer and wine distributing. I thought we'd make a getting at it, but it didn't work out. So I was interviewed by my wife's former boss, who's in the furniture business here in Youngstown. And he offered me an opportunity to uh, be a salesman. I'd never done anything like that before, but I, uh, it was a challenge to me. So I became a salesman in the furniture business. And after about a year, I was the manager of the place and uh, became a success. I decided the one time or other I'd go in business for myself, which I did. Only I, let, I was influenced to a diet, to nutrition. So I opened up a health food store. That was a challenge. We had it for 50 years. It was very successful. Today it still exists. We still help out once in a while, but we furthered the cause of what we considered better nutrition and diet in the United States. We became involved in the whole movement for vegetarianism. This is our cause, keeping people alive longer. What we did in the Army, we did in, in the nutritional field. I became national president of the health food industry. So that's the heritage. And what were your feelings at the time, uh, arriving in the China Burma, India Theater. Well, I was impressed by the tremendous gap between rich and poor. I saw people lying in the streets. Bodies would be gathered up in the morning, people dying of hunger. And at the same time, there were those who were extravagantly, obscenely rich, who owned people like slaves. I said, this is what we fought for in this world war, where we, while slavery can exist in all these nations, so there was a lot of work to be done because in South Africa they still had apartheid. I thought the war isn't over. Well, this goes on. In many countries, people were still being enslaved. Women were being exploited. People were being racially lynched. It says, we've got a lot to do here. And the only one, one sign of progress was when, when, Vice, when President Truman they gave us an executive order and abolished racial segregation in the armed forces. This gave me hope. Those things gave me encouragement. And I wanted to be a part of that. And I did some of that when I was a union organizer. So we all have to do what our part to make life worth living and make it a pride to our own people. Okay, I see here uh, Fort Dix, New Jersey. Is that where you took your basic training? Or that where you were set? After I got basic war. training all over the United States at various, at various institutions. They found out that I had talents to put shows together. So I did that with the Red Cross. We organized it wherever there was morale building to be done, as they called it. And I got commendations for that. And then I was immediately made from private to corporal, then from corporal to sergeant. By the time I went overseas, I was first sergeant in charge of 40 men to give them morale builder boosters. I thought I was doing some good. There's a lot to be done. I'll do it when I come home. I'm still doing it in one way or another. And on your arrival back here in the States, yes, uh, you were going to go back to live in New York. That was, that was the original idea. <coughs> and you did? I did. 
That's when I started to attend class at Columbia University. School of Journalism. And when did you start a family? Not long after I met your mother. And what it, describe your family. Tell us about your family. Well, when I was going to Columbia University, that's when your brother Jeff was born. And uh, we decided, and then I didn't felt uh, economically it was getting to be a problem because there weren't that many jobs open. It was long before I got into the nutritional field. But uh, Ruth was out lonesome for her family in Youngstown, Ohio. I said, okay, I'll try to make a living there. So let's go there, and that's what we did. We went to Youngstown, Ohio, got involved with her father in business, which didn't succeed, and then you were born while we were in Youngstown. So I had to respond. And you had two sons. Yeah, I still do. And what are their names? Now, too. What are your sons' names? What well, are your sons' names? One is Mark Huberman, who is now Chief Magistrate for Domestic Relations Court in this area. The other is Jeffrey Huberman, was dean at Bradley University in Peoria. I'm very proud of them, and they produce some wonderful children. And what is your wife's name, and what does she do? Ruth Huberman looks after me like a mother hen. They, 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 everyone that I looked at, they're not looking after me. I try not to put too much of a burden on them now in my 80s. How old is she, and what, does she still work? Yes, yeah, matter of fact, she's in her 80s. I'm trying to catch up to her. And uh, she works three, four days a week at the health food store that we opened 50 years ago. She still helps out there. I don't know where she gets all that stamina from. But are, you the, are you the go-getter? Yes, that's what they call me, the go-getter. My wife works, I go get her. <laughs> all right, during your uh, service, you worked with the Red Cross. Yes. Entertaining. Yes. Was there anybody famous? You'd come across? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, this is the truth. I'm very proud of that. I still have it in my scrapbook. I got a call from my captain calling me to the main office, main headquarters. You've got some visitors, Sergeant. It turned out the visitors were Lily Pons and her husband, Andre Castellanos. Lily Pons was a world famous opera singer. Andre Castellanos was a world famous orchestra leader and, and musician. And the reason they came to ask for me is because they heard that there was a Huberman in the area. And they had been very close friends to Branislav Huberman, a world-famous violinist. And they wanted to know if I was related, so they came to visit me in my, in my hut that I lived in while I was on, in the army there. And Lily Pons, I had seen her at the World's Fair years before. She's such a little thing, but a great voice, great singer. She was a beautiful woman. And she came in and she says, Andre wanted to meet you if you were related to Branislav Huberman. Well, I vaguely understood that I was through my father, who was a cousin of him, a second cousin or something like that. And Andre Castellanos, with tears, shook me and embraced me. And I could see a Huberman after all these years because there are no other Hubermans alive as far as he knew. So that was an experience for me. Then Henry Armstrong, a boxer that I had boxed with as a sparring partner, he came to see me, gave me his order. He, he autographed a rupee. That was an Indian, um, car, car, Indian bob dollar worth about 30 cents. And I, I had that Melvin Douglas, the actor at that time, was quite a, an actor. He came to see me. And that, that made me feel like I was famous. Was that the Red Cross or the USO that you were doing shows for? Both. Both. Mostly Red Cross overseas. You didn't have USOs. USOs was in the United States. Did you have any other family members, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunts, involved in the war effort in any way? Well, my, my, uh, my other brother who passed away during the final months of the war. He was in Japan. He was stationed there after Japan had surrendered. He still had troops there. So he served for a couple of months. My brother who recently died, he was too young to be conscripted. So he never saw the service. So I was the, I was the hero of the Huberman clan. And I can only wish that all those of the Huberman family and extended relatives will dedicate themselves to making this world a better place to live in and starting with where they live right now. Let there be peace on earth. 
let it begin with me. Well, I'm uh, pretty proud of my dad, proud of him as a veteran, proud of him as a writer, proud of him as a uh, humanitarian, and uh, most of all, proud to just have him with me here at 80, at 80, uh, 80 some years old. 80, what are you, 86? A couple of months. 86, you'll be, uh, yes, be, you'll be 86. So what's your birthday? September 23rd. September 23rd, 1921. 1921, that's not too bad. Uh, I'm mighty proud. I hope I can live up to half of the ideals that, uh, half of the ideals that, uh, that he has, uh, have accomplished half the things he's accomplished in his life. It's been pretty great. Did you receive any medals, Max? Yes, yeah, quite a few. You want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, the Special Services issued a medal for my giving what they considered above and beyond the call of duty. Instead of the regular military hours, I'd be up maybe all kinds of hours organizing things before they lost my mind. While they were fresh in my mind, I'd wake up others, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Okay, you're part of it. I mean, I used to assign people to that. They overdid it, but they, they forgive me. So I... I, I, I got the discharge medal, you know, honorable service that we all received. I was glad I was just around to receive anything. Did you, you know? uh, did you buy your house on the GI Bill with a with a VA loan? Is that how you no no no? no. By that time, I was earning money. Oh, okay. I was in the health food business, and I knew. Gotcha. Um, yeah. As okay. a matter of fact, I started to buy a house for your living right now, but it was sold out by the time I got back to it. There you go. Okay. Thank you, Max. You're a hero. Thank you for the opportunity.